so then I can start. Um, so today's webinar is uh, on viruses and viral diseases. Uh, the idea is to first get a broad understanding of what viruses are, how can they make us sick, and then uh, focus on the case of COVID-19 as one like real life case of how viruses can produce diseases. Uh, my name is Eugenia Goberton. I am a virologist. I have a PhD in structural virology that I got in the Institut Pasteur in Paris. I am working with Lectures Without Borders. You will see the logo uh, here in the bottom right of the screen. Uh, lectures Without Borders is an organization that normally um, organizes lectures all over the world for scientists to go to, to visit schools and universities all over the world. And right now, because of uh, the pandemic, all, a bit of, like, well, most of, of our on-site activities are kind of stopped. Um, but we are going more into offline, uh, online, sorry, online activities. Um, and this is, these webinars are part of our online activities. Um, and these webinars, we're also organizing them uh, in collaboration with Just One Giant Lab. That is an initiative, they have an initiative called Open COVID-19. And in that initiative, um, they are collaborating with us on giving these webinars to educate students all over the world on what viruses are, how they make us sick, and talk a bit more about COVID-19. I will um, organize this talk around 20 frequently asked questions. Um, if I manage to make my screen, yeah, there we go. Um, so there we go. Um, I will organize it around 20 frequently asked questions. Why? Because I think these are very important questions that most people uh, ask about viruses and about diseases and they're topics that I think are very important to then understand COVID-19 itself. Um, the first question, of course, is what is a virus? So I will start with that one. A virus is an infectious agent that replicates only inside living cells. And viral particles, so viruses are free in nature in the form of viral particles. Viral particles are formed of nucleic acids. Uh, so they have a genome, a genetic material that is inside a thing that's called a capsid that is formed of proteins. So the nucleic acids can be DNA or RNA, and then there's protein around them that protect them, that allow for infection and that allow for replication of the virus. Um, what you're seeing in this slide is a schematic of a non-enveloped virus. And the fact that I say that there are non-enveloped viruses already hints that there exists another type of virus that is called enveloped virus. Um, the enveloped viruses, the viral particles have exactly the same components but they also have a lipid envelope that surrounds this um, capsid of proteins. And this envelope is the one that contains the proteins that will be involved in infection. So basically, this is just a slightly more complex type of virus. I bring this difference up because we are going to see then when we talk about COVID-19, that actually COVID-19 is a type of envelope virus. And Envelope viruses were actually the topic of my PhD, so I actually find them fascinating, and I know a lot about envelope viruses. Um, so why do I say the word infectious agent? Why do I call them infectious agent instead of calling them microorganisms? This is a very, very common mistake. There's a lot of people that call viruses microorganisms, and at the same time, that confuses virus with bacteria, and a very good example of that is that actually in WhatsApp, for example, there is no emoji for a virus. There's only an emoji for a bacteria. And a lot of people, when they want to say coronavirus, they put an emoji of a corona and then this emoji here that is actually a bacteria. And why are bacteria organism, microorganisms and viruses are not? Because viruses are not organisms. An organism is an individual entity that is capable of reproduction, of growth and development, of maintenance and some response, some degree of response to stimuli. And actually viruses cannot do that when they are outside a cell. Viruses, when they are outside a cell, are not living entities. And this is actually question number two. A virus is alive. This is a bit of a philosophical question because there is some biologists that call viruses living entities. I particularly don't consider them living because they behave as non-living entities when they are outside the cell. 
they reproduce and they replicate and they evolve only once they enter a cell. Before, when they are outside, they are inert, as inert as any mineral that can be around, as anything that composes a grain of dust. But when they enter a cell, is then when they can start replicating and producing more copies of themselves. And that is when evolution and, well, I wouldn't say response to stimuli, but why not, can happen. The thing is that in and of themselves, the viruses, to me, are not alive. A question that also is tricky is that I've been using this sort of schematic of a virus, and you will see it a lot, that most people draw viruses in the same way, but viruses don't all look the same. First of all, they have different shapes. There are a lot of different shapes of viruses, and here I will put some examples of human viruses. Some, here are two examples of non-enveloped viruses uh, that are extremely common, adenovirus and papillomavirus. Are human viruses very common? Adenovirus tends to cause common cold, but also causes something else. And papillomavirus tends to cause skin infections. Um, and there are some enveloped viruses, like for example, yellow fever virus, smallpox virus, or Ebola virus, that if you see them, actually you could say that papillomavirus looks more like yellow fever virus, that is a completely different type of virus than another non enveloped viruses. Or Ebola virus looks like nothing of the other. So there's actually a huge amount of different shapes that viruses can take. And also there's a lot of different sizes. The viruses that we were seeing just now, the, the smallpox virus is this, variola virus, and Ebola virus are huge viruses. You have big viruses like herpes, then you have adenovirus that I mentioned are much smaller, and then you have uh, papillomavirus and, well, yellow fever virus, for example, that uh, is like dengue virus here. These are small viruses, and then you have the extremely tiny viruses like hepatitis viruses. Um, so there are a lot of different shapes and different sizes. And talking about sizes, one thing that I like to do, because I was mentioning that this one was a common mistake, confusing a bacteria with a virus. If you put a bacteria next to a virus, the virus is much, 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 much smaller than the bacteria. And if you put both of them next to a human cell, an actual kind of tiny human cells, which is a red cell, red blood cell, um, then you will find that the virus is extremely tiny next to what a human cells would be. Let's go back for a second to this um, definition of a virus being an infectious agent that replicates inside living cells, because this can let us understand like what is the process by which a virus can replicate inside living cells. This process is called viral infection, and this is question number five. What is a viral infection? So viral infection is a process through which the virus can replicate inside cells. It is not just the entry of the virus, it's the entry, the replication, and the release of the virus. This is one of the most common mistakes. People think that infection is the entry of the virus to the cell, but infection is a whole thing. And I'm going to explain a little bit uh, what these three steps are. Of course, starting with the entry. Um, the entry, the viral entry, is considered, well, the process, that is how you call the moment in which the virus delivers the genetic material into the cell. Why do I talk about the virus delivering genetic material and not about the virus entering the cell? Because sometimes the virus, even though the, it's called viral entry, sometimes the virus doesn't enter with the full particle into the cell, it just only delivers its genetic material. This is the case for all the non-enveloped viruses. Non-enveloped viruses just bind to a receptor in the surface of the cell and inject their DNA or RNA into the cell. This still is considered viral entry because the genetic material of the virus is inside the cell. The capsid, however, remains outside the cell. In the case of enveloped viruses, the whole capsid enters the cell because I said that the enveloped viruses have a lipid envelope, they also recognize something in the surface of the cell that we call receptors, and then fuse their membrane to the membrane of the cell and release the capsid inside the, the cell. 
And of course, at the end, the viral genome goes free inside the cell. The viral entry doesn't finish until the genetic material of the virus is free inside the cell. Once the genetic material is free inside the cell, the viral replication can start because the viral replication is the moment in which the virus makes copies of itself inside the cell. This also has a few steps. First of all, I said the genome of the virus, the genome of the virus is free inside the cell. And once this is the case, if it is a DNA, it can go through RNA, an RNA step, but this is not so important for us. The important part is that once the genome is inside the cell, it uses the machinery of the cell. It tricks the machinery of the cell to convince it to stop producing proteins that are important for the cell and start producing proteins that are important for the virus. So viruses start producing their own proteins inside the cells and then they assemble into viral particles. This is what we call viral replication. The moment in which one copy of the virus that entered the cell turns into many copies of the virus inside the cell. And then there's step number three, that is the moment in which all these particles are released. That there are mainly two ways in which viruses exit cells. I illustrate both ways with non-enveloped viruses, but then I will also mention the enveloped ones. Um, one of the ways that is, let's say, the nicest for the cell is when um, viruses actually signal that they want to be released. And in that case, what they do is basically ask the cell to release them one by one. So each particle is released one by one. There's another less nice way of exiting that is um, basically the virus fills up the cell so much that at the end the virus, the cell explodes and releases all the virus around. This side, even this um, way of exiting, even though it, it is not as nice for the cell, it is very efficient for the virus because immediately there is a lot of viral load around the cell and it gives less time for the immune system to react to the infection. In any case, envelope viruses, since I mentioned that they have a lipid envelope, there's only one way in which envelope viruses can exit the cell, and it is by signaling that they want to be released. Because these viruses, what they do is they bud out of the cell, and they take a bit of the membrane of the cell with them. And that is where the envelope viruses get, get their envelope. What can viruses infect? Because I'm talking about the fact that, you know, they enter cells, but can they actually infect any type of cells? Actually, yes. They can infect every type of living cells, and this is also something that people sometimes associate viruses with human and or animal diseases in general, but they can also infect every other type of living cell, including, and most importantly, actually, bacteria. So the importance of virus in the development of every of any, every one of these cells is very important. It's not only they produce disease, they are able to infect cells and they do infect everything. Our cells are constantly being uh, infected by viruses and every bacteria that we have in our gut is also infected by viruses and we need viruses. This is something that I will go back to several times, but really um, viruses can infect every single type of living cell. What is the difference then between infection and disease? If I say that they infect basically every single living cell, why are not all living cells ill? Why don't all living cells die because they are infected with viruses? Well, there's a lot of viruses that don't kill the cells, the cells that they infect. I was telling you that there are a lot of viruses that just signal that they want to exit, in which case they are not exploding the cell. And at the same time, if the virus is not producing a very high rate. It's basically as if my sister was asking me to help her with something. My sister asked me to help her for an hour. I can stop what I'm doing, help for her for an hour, then continue what I'm doing. And my employer and my friends and my partner, nobody will actually realize that I took an hour out to help her because it didn't really consume much of my resources. The thing is, if my sister asked me for help and she actually asked me to do seven hours per day of her things, then of course everybody around me will realize that I don't have any time for myself. This is the difference between what happens with an acute infection that can cause a disease and one that doesn't. In this case, in 
viruses that are produced at low rate don't consume a lot of the energy of the cell and are released of, from the cell, they can easily just produce a chronic infection that has absolutely no symptoms and thus it is not a disease. Because the cell can basically barely notice that they are infected. They continue their lives and just from time to time produce one viral particle and that's okay. The problem is when viruses either kill the cells to exit or they consume too much of the resources of the cell. Like I was saying, if my sister asked me to help her all the time, then at some point I will not have time for myself and I will, my, my work will suffer and my friendships will suffer and everything will suffer. And that, when my normal duties are disturbed, is when I start malfunctioning or dysfunctioning. And since cells are, are arranged in the body in the form of tissues, Whenever there is a dysfunction of a tissue is when we call it a disease. We say that that tissue is diseased. And this also explains why different viral diseases have different symptoms. Because I mentioned that viruses infect cells and that they recognize something in the cells to infect them. Well, not all viruses infect all cells because not all viruses, uh, not all cells have the same types of receptors on the membrane. So neuroviruses can affect all types of cells. And since different types of cells are forming different tissues, the type of cell that a virus can infect determines which kind of tissue will be malfunctioning. And since this tissue dysfunction is what we call disease, the symptoms depend on the types of tissue that are affected by the virus. Very good example of this is a virus that can for example, insect, infect cells in the respiratory tract, then they will give, for example, a cough. Why? Because the tissue that is affected by this virus is a tissue of the lungs. While a virus that cannot recognize the lungs but can recognize the skin will produce a rash and not cough because it is affecting actually only the cells of the skin. In general, viruses don't infect only one tissue, they infect a collection of tissue, tissues because these tissues share some re receptors. And this collection of symptoms that they cause is what allows the doctor in the end to point to one virus as the cause of the disease. This, of course, can also be done by testing and by a lot of things. But in general, what you do when you go to a doctor, you say, okay, I have a cough, I have a fever and nothing else. Then it's probably a common cold. But if you have a, a cough and a fever, but you also have, I don't know, back pain, then it's more probably flu than a common cold because you have a different collection of symptoms. Can we treat a viral disease? So once the doctor already identified that you have viral disease, can you do something about it? Well, I will first try to, to explain uh, how the body reacts to the infection to then explain um, how we can treat it or how we can help it. So whenever we have an infection, the infected cells signal to the immune system that there is something and the immune system detects this viral infection. What the immune system normally does is try to ne neutralize, this is what is shown in this image, that is antibodies neutralizing a virus. Um, the immune system tries to neutralize the virus and clear the virus out of the body. So basically, make sure that all the virus is eliminated. This whole process can take between three and 10 days for most acute viral diseases. And that is why the disease itself tend to last between three and 10 days. So in general, a common cold lasts around five, a flu tends to, like, to last three, and some diseases like mononucleosis, 10 or 15 days. But in general, between 10 and, th and three and 10 days. And what is the treatment then? Like if the body is getting rid of the, of the virus by itself, why do we need a treatment? Treatments in general aim to one of two things. Either they try to reduce the symptoms or increase the, the speed by which the body clears the, the virus out. The treatments that aim to reduce symptoms normally don't modify the length of the disease. So the disease still takes three to 10 days, but it makes it more bearable for the person that is diseased so that 
they can continue with feeling a bit better while their bodies fight this disease. These treatments act on the immune system because most of those symptoms that we see are actually manifestations of the immune system themselves. They try, so these treatments, what they do is they act on the part of the immune system that is producing all those other kind of side effects of the infection and make sure that it gives it time to fight better the, the virus. The other treatments, the ones that increase the clearance of the virus, what they do is, the idea is that they would shorten the disease. So instead of being sick for three weeks, you will be sick for five days. And in order to do that, they either help the immune system or they act directly on the virus. For example, by binding the virus and making sure that that virus that is already circulating in the body will not continue to reinfect cells. Can we cure a viral disease? So let's say we have one of these molecules that binds to every single virus and takes it out of the body. Can we actually consider a disease cured? The answer is yes. Most viruses can be cleared completely, at least in some patients, most of them, including diseases that were considered incurable until very recently, like AIDS. It's been shown for thousands or even millions of patients that you can be cleared of viruses that were considered that were going to infect you chronically forever. What we don't know yet, and it's the subject of a lot of studies, is why some patients do it better than others. But there's a lot of treatments that actually are aiming to cure diseases. There are also some viruses that produce lifelong immunity against future infections. This is what is being discussed a lot about COVID-19. There's a lot of people that are wondering whether people that already had, had it will not have it again. There is a lot of evidence that it is the case that you do produce lifelong immunity. A very good example of lifelong immunity is uh, chickenpox. Chickenpox is a disease that when you get it when you're very young, then you're protected forever. And that's why there's people that <laughs> kind of purposefully give it to their children. Um, but well, in any case, just like with the clearance of the virus, with the curing, this is also not always the case, the lifelong immunity, and especially it's not the case for every patient. Patient, So sometimes you have to be careful. And that's why there's been also some reports of, yeah, there's been one case in Wuhan of a person that got reinfected. It's very, very tricky to show, and it's never 100%. But Yes, most viral diseases can eventually be cured, yet not always, and the cure may not prevent reinfection. So treatments are cool because they can cure it, but they are not ideal. But how can we prevent a viral disease? This is actually what we want to do. Ideally, we would like to prevent the disease from starting. And there are two well, first let's start with what, what, what do I call prevent a viral disease? And then I will explain like the two ways in which we can do that. Um, preventing a viral disease involves blocking either the entry, the replication or, or the release of the virus from cells. There are several molecules that can do this. And by doing this, like there's this image joining some, uh, showing some molecules bound to a virus that doesn't allow that virus to enter a cell. So these molecules that block uh, any of the steps of the infection, what they do is they prevent the infection itself. And without infection, of course, they cannot be a disease. So basically they are preventing the disease. And I said there are two main types of molecules that do this. One are called antiviral drugs and another type of molecule is vaccines. I'm going to go to both of them in detail, starting with antiviral drugs. What are antiviral drugs and how do they work? Antiviral drugs are drugs that are um, given to a patient after the initial infection. So in general, either because this person got tested for a disease and showed that they had the virus, or because it has already some symptoms that are showing that this person has that virus. There is a suspicion of the virus. It's tested, it's confirmed, wonderful, we give them antiviral drugs. Once this initial infection was already done, the only thing you can do in order to prevent the disease 
what you're doing is preventing the spreading of the virus. The virus already entered the body, but you're preventing it from spreading widely enough to actually start producing symptoms and produce a disease. In order to do that, you can target any of the three steps of the infection. You can either block the entry of the cells to more cells than it, of the virus to more cells than it already did, or block the replication of the virus inside the cell, or block the release. And they can either target the virus directly or act on the immune system. This is the characteristics on the antiviral drugs. Most antiviral drugs, especially the ones that act on the immune system, are kind of universal in the sense that they are useful for more than one virus. That is kind of not the case with vaccines. A vaccine is a special type, let's say, of antiviral, but it has to be given to someone before any infection. So that is why we vaccinate kids when they are very young, because we want them to be naive to infection. We want their bodies to have never seen that virus before. What they do is actually prevent that initial infection. They make sure that the body will recognize the virus even before it infects the first cell. They normally, what they do is target the virus entry, not just any step on the replication, but virus entry in general. And what they do is they act directly in the immune system, like I said, preparing the immune system to recognize the, the virus. But how do they do this? So to explain it in simple terms, the immune system recognizes viruses because it detects the clothes that the virus wears. For example, we can say Ebola virus normally dresses with orange trousers and a white t-shirt. This is the information that the immune system has to know in order to be able to recognize this virus. So vaccines train the immune system to recognize those clothes faster. So basically you are just like in military training, you can train someone to recognize a threat very easily. You can train the immune system to see the color orange and just in case prepare to prevent infection. And the bad news about this is that every virus tends to use different clothes, which tends to mean that we need one vaccine per virus. That's why we don't have, like I was saying earlier for antiviral drugs, there's a lot of antiviral drugs that work against many viruses, but there is almost no vaccine that works for more than one virus because viruses don't really share clothes, except in very, very, very related uh, viruses, which is basically like my sister used to steal my t-shirts. Sometimes they do use the same or very similar type of t-shirt. And that is when we can say that a vaccine has cross reactivity. So it can affect or yeah, act on the immune system to prepare it for more than one virus. How are vaccines developed? It's basically the same question as how do you build a dummy for a crash test for cars? First of all, I said the immune system recognizes viruses because it detects the clothes. So first of all, you have to yourself know which clothes the virus will wear. Not only which clothes, but also how it wears them. Some viruses do use or yeah, wear very, very, very similar clothes, but Sometimes they wear them in combination with something else, or they wear them folded upside down, or they wear it in a way that is not so easy for the immune system to recognize. So the first step in developing a vaccine is to know exactly which clothes and how the virus will wear them. Then you have to identify of these clothes that the virus will wear, exactly which one will be the best candidate for the immune system to detect. Why? Because, for example, I said the Ebola virus might be wearing orange trousers with a white t-shirt. A white t-shirt might not be very easy to see against the white background, that is, let's say, the background of the body. But orange trousers will probably stand out, stand out quite a lot. So it's better if you're going to develop something to train your immune system to detect Ebola. It's better to train it to detect orange trousers than something that might look very similar to everything else, like could be a white t-shirt. So this is a very important step, identifying which ones are the most promising candidates. Then 
once you identify them, you can create these fake clothes, like this, I was saying with the dummy for a crash test, you create something that is similar enough, but not exactly the same, that will not make the body sick, but will train it to detect the real thing. And then you trick the immune system with it. But wait, no, you don't use this as vaccine yet, because first you have to try if it works. First, you have to try on cells, you have to see inside the lab if it works, you have to try on animals, then you have to try in humans. And you have to evaluate whether it is safe and it is efficient. This is the most important step of all, and it is the step that takes the longest or should take the longest. Unfortunately, sometimes there's a lot of people that want to skip this step. And actually, that is one thing that happened extremely recently with COVID-19. It happened that there was this French scientist that said that he had found this miracle cure for COVID. He released it. A lot of governments around the world started using it. It was not only not helping, it was killing people. This thing was not safe enough and it was not at all efficient against the virus. It was not killing the virus. It was not helping the immune system. It was basically doing nothing against the virus, but it was a bit affecting people's hearts. So evaluating safety and efficacy is extremely important. And once this is done, you can produce the virus in the vaccine, sorry, in large quantities and make it available for everyone. But again, the most important and longest step is step number five. Now, once the vaccine is released and everybody starts using it, can the vaccine eliminate the virus completely? This is a very tricky question because no, vaccines don't eliminate the virus. The virus will continue to be in the environment. What vaccines do is protect us from getting infected by the virus. In that sense, vaccines can potentially eradicate a disease. Why do I say potentially? Because they eradicate diseases only if they are used correctly and sustained over time. It is the case with a lot of diseases that were eradicated in the past or were very close to being eradicated completely, that people relaxed or they stopped believing in vaccines for whatever reason and they stopped vaccinating their kids. And there are diseases that are killing kids today that we hadn't had in more than 70 years. You have to use vaccines correctly and sustain their use over time if you want a vaccine to eradicate a disease. Now that I gave all this huge overview of what viruses are and what diseases are, viral diseases are, I would like to focus on COVID-19 itself. In a way, kind of for applying all this to a real life scenario, we are all living through a pandemic that has affected our lives in a lot of ways. And I think the overview that I gave might help us understand a bit better what's the big deal. First of all, COVID-19, is it a disease or a virus? Might happen that for some of you, it is obvious, but for a lot of people, it is not. And I've read it wrong a lot of times. COVID-19 is a disease and the virus behind the disease is called SARS-CoV-2 or sars coronavirus 2 Of course, the fact that it is called coronavirus 2 means that there was a sars coronavirus one. Um, and yes, even though a lot of people call it the coronavirus or just coronavirus, it is not the only coronavirus that infects humans. Of course, first of all, it is not the only coronavirus. Most coronaviruses, there are millions that we already know, uh, infect animals, other animals that are not humans. And of the ones that infect humans, we have already characterized very well six other types of human coronaviruses. And two of them caused epidemics very recently. One is, called, one is called MERS coronavirus and the other is SARS coronavirus that now is called SARS coronavirus 1. Um, the very good news about we already knowing that these cousins exist is that we have already studied them for several years. So we can use the knowledge that we have about their cousins to try to understand better this one. And this has helped a lot. Believe me, I had um, a colleague in my lab that was studying coronaviruses. And for several years, a lot of people asked her, what is your interest in coronaviruses? I mean, nobody cares because it's true until 
last year nobody cared about coronaviruses because they were a thing that from time to time appeared. They became a big deal. And it is important to study every type of virus that may eventually produce a problem because you never know when a virus that normally would not infect or be a big deal, now it can suddenly be a big deal. So good news, we had already characterized very well six other types of coronaviruses and we used all this knowledge to know this one better. Now, what do we know actually about this virus, about SARS-CoV-2? Well, first, going back to what I explained at the beginning, SARS-CoV-2 is an envelope virus. And I told you viruses could have a molecule that can be an RNA or a DNA. In the case of SARS-CoV-2, it is an RNA molecule. So they have a genome that is formed of an RNA mo molecule. It is surrounded by proteins. Th those proteins are surrounded by a lipid envelope. And on this envelope, there's this protein that you may or may not have heard of that is called S protein. A lot of people are trying to target this protein to produce vaccines because I said vaccines affect the entry of the virus. And this protein is the most important protein for the, um, for the entry of the virus. How do the virus enter cells? Well, I said envelope viruses fuse their membranes. And this virus recognizes a receptor that is called ACE2 that is present on the cell surface. And the protein, the S protein, here it says viral glycoproteins because it was talking about in general envelope viruses. The glycoprotein of SARS CoV 2 is called S protein. And it is the one that is responsible for the fusion of the virus to the cell and the release of the material, the genetic material inside the cell. So that is why people that want to produce vaccines try to understand better how the S protein works. Now, I say that this ACE2 is present in the cell surface. Is it present on the cell surface in every cell? Well, no. It is present on the cell surface on, lung, on, the, on the cells of the lungs and on the cells of small intestine. And that is why most, if not all, the patients that develop symptoms, they develop them in the lungs or they show digestive symptoms. There's a lot of people that didn't report to have coronavirus that actually did have it. The thing is they develop digestive symptoms and a lot of people don't know that the virus actually produces digestive symptoms. So I think I actually did have coronavirus, but I will get tested in them soon and will let you know. Um, the thing is, what I told you about how the symptoms of a disease depend on the type of tissue a virus infects, here is where you can see it. ACE2 is not present in all the cells, it's present in the lungs and in the small intestines, and that's why everybody coughs. Now, let's go back to the disease, COVID-19. What is a pandemic? This is another concept that for a lot of people is not clear. A lot of people think that COVID-19 is a pandemic because we have a lot of cases. Yes, we have a lot of cases, but a pandemic is not dependent on how many cases. In order to understand what a pandemic is, I would like first to introduce the concept of epidemiology. Epidemiology is a discipline that studies the, inc the incidence, the distribution, and the possible control of diseases. Why do I say this because I want you to focus for a second in the word distribution. A pandemic is not defined by number, it's defined by distribution. So actually, the, let's say the weight of a disease in public health is more dependent on the distribution of the disease than on the numbers. Even though, of course, every life counts and having a thousand people deceased in the Sahara is the same as having them spread all over the world but in the eye of public health one is a big th threat and the other is not so i would like to explain concepts that are related to this to get to the pandemic first one is what is a an, an endemic disease there are diseases that are endemic to areas and in this case what happens is there are periodic outbreaks so let's say once a year around the same time of the year there's a small, for example, it is the case, I'm from Argentina, and it is the case in the north of Argentina, 
of Chagas disease. Chagas disease is a disease that basically every single summer kills people. Not many, but uh, luckily not many, but it does kill people. But it comes every single summer. We already kind of know when it will be and where. It is very geographically contained. So if you go outside that area, you will not find any cases. And if you want to avoid the disease, you basically have to avoid going to that area and then you're safe. When a disease goes outside the normal area where it is endemic and or when there is a new disease, what happens is maybe the disease was not endemic to anywhere, but it just kind of emerged somewhere. And then what happens is there's some sort of big outbreak, sometimes bigger than others. In that case, it is not an endemic disease because it's not periodic. Um, but, or maybe it is endemic, but it kind of now expanded and now it is an epidemic. You can talk about new areas, places that normally were not infected with that place, with that uh, disease. Otherwise, other, poof, either because the disease didn't exist at all or because it was not endemic in that area, but that suddenly they have an outbreak. It is, for example, the case for Ebola. A couple of years ago, in 2017, there was a huge epidemic of Ebola in West Africa. For a lot of people are like, yeah, but Ebola always happens in Africa. Yes, but it never happens where it did happen in 2016 and 17. Um, it normally happens more in East Africa and this time it was a huge epidemic in West Africa. Even sometimes when it happens in East Africa, it's also considered an, ep an epidemic because it grows bigger than it usually does. So an important concept about endemic diseases and epidemics is that it doesn't really tell anything about how deadly the virus is. It just tells us that it is somehow geographically contained and that by avoiding go into regions that have the disease, your risk of getting the disease is very, very, very close to zero. This is absolutely not the case with a pandemic. And that is why a pandemic is so important. It's not because of the virus. The virus is not more deadly than any other virus. It's actually much less deadly than Ebola, for example. But there is no place, virtually not play, no place, of course. Of course, there are places, but um in in global terms we could say there's almost no place where you could be safe where your risk of getting the disease is actually zero um that is the definition of a pandemic it's a disease that is so almost evenly distributed around the whole world that basically you cannot move somewhere else to be safe wherever you are you have a non-zero risk of getting the disease that is the definition of a pandemic and that is what makes COVID-19 so important. Not that it is more deadly, just that it is more distributed. And basically every person that you would usually just, you know, go somewhere else to avoid getting the disease or avoid going on holidays to a certain spot because right now there's an epidemic something. No, they cannot do it. Wherever they go, the risk is no zero. So we have to wait until the pandemic is over and pandemics eventually are over. They have always been. And then we will be able to go back to a normal situation in which maybe we cannot know. Maybe it becomes endemic in certain places. Maybe it becomes endemic in a lot of places, in which case we will eventually get to a periodical ry rhythm of having SARS CoV 2. Or maybe not. Maybe it actually kind of disappears forever, like it is the case for a lot of viruses in the past. Now, is there any treatment? Let's say we did get the disease, what happens? For now, all treatments are aimed at reducing symptoms and stimulating the immune response. Uh, one, one, that one treatment that is becoming slightly more famous in this past week, actually, is called doxycycline. And doxycycline is a treatment that normally what it does is reducing the inflammatory response. So what they do is basically uh, re reduce the part of the immune response that would produce bad symptoms and extends the time of survival of the person so that their immune, the immune system can clear the virus out. The virus is cured by itself. It is resolved by itself. 
but all the treatments are basically aiming at reducing the symptoms and simulating this response so that it is faster. Now, there's a lot of effort, an incredible amount of effort, made towards funding a cure and eventually to prevent COVID-19. So can we expect a vaccine soon? The answer is no. And a lot of people ask me, yeah, but I heard that in September there will be a vaccine. If there is a vaccine in September, I will not use it. Why? Because remember that I told you that there are a lot of steps? Well, these ones, we are doing them extremely fast. Because we, basically everybody started trying to understand this virus. So we characterize their clothes very well. We already know how it's detected. We already have a lot of candidates, a lot of vaccine candidates. So it is the first time that we do all these things so fast. In general, these things think, take years. For viruses, just like, I don't know, HIV took, took years to understand how the immune response is against that virus. We have never done this faster than with SARS-CoV-2. So we're already getting to this step of trying things. There's a lot of labs around the world that are already trying vaccine candidates. The biggest problem is that these two steps, especially number five, that is the one that I told you is extremely important. They take at least one and a half years. You cannot rush those steps. And if you do, you're doing something wrong. Why? Because there are serial, serious ethical implications to this. You cannot give or you shouldn't give a vaccine to someone before you're sure that it works well enough and that it doesn't have serious side effects. So that's why I say that if somebody releases a vaccine in a month from now, I will not use it. Because a vaccine that, was, that is released a month from now has not been tried in enough animals, enough people, enough cells, enough anything. And also, it hasn't been followed for long enough to know if there is some side effect. What if they follow the person that got the vaccine today for a month and then they give me the vaccine? And then actually a month and a half after getting the vaccine, they die. We have to follow them. We have to see for each and every trial that we do, we have controls, we have a lot of regulations because Basically, the whole point is let's not go back to trying things blindly because that is what they were doing in World War II. And that's why all this <laughs> bioethics exists. So we shall not expect a vaccine against COVID-19 for at least, I would say, one more year, maybe one and a half. So basically, by the end of 2021, we might have a vaccine if everything goes well. I am hopeful that we will find it. So we don't have a vaccine soon, but what do we do in the meantime? What we already know, actually, what we hear all the time, we have to prevent the spread of the virus, especially towards people that are very, very susceptible to this virus and can develop serious symptoms. So first of all, don't panic. You will be okay. Probably every single person you know, know and love will be okay. I do have a lot of friends and family members that got coronavirus and luckily they're all okay. Keep physical distance. Unfortunately for an Argentinian, because we love hugging, um, we do have to be very careful until this is under control, especially for the next year and it will be long until we actually have a vaccine or a very, very good treatment. Um, wash your hands a lot, not obsessively, but wash your hands a lot and cover your mouth and nose, especially when you sneeze or cough, because maybe you are having the disease right now, just, well, the virus right now, you basically are not developing a disease because you didn't have any symptoms. You still can give it to somebody else. So just be extremely careful, especially towards those that are at higher risk. And with that, I would like to thank you very much. I really hope you learned something. And if you have any questions, we can definitely address them now. Thank you very much, uh, Eugenia. It was very interesting. I. Actually, I was thinking while you were uh, holding the presentation that I uh, 
I had a lot of confusion regarding viruses and bacteria, and I used the emoji that you mentioned on the phone without knowing uh, that actually it was for uh, for bacteria. So thank you very much for uh, for the information. And if any of the participants have any questions, and maybe if you can also leave us maybe your email address and contact info. But we can also do ask questions a yeah. recording later uh, yeah. just to share it with your other students right oh thank yes. you that that would be great unfortunately for us we have also exams this week uh, for some students and maybe that's why some of them didn't join um, does anyone have questions or comments or some feedback so it seems uh, no okay. but that's okay that it all was well everyone is thinking I think <laughs> thinking about the, the info processing yeah it is a lot of information and that's why I, I like to share the slides and and the recording possibly um, for afterwards so that if you have at some point any more questions or you read something that maybe you see that it doesn't at all match with what you thought you understood from my talk, you can easily just email me and tell me, you know, I just read this and you said that it was not the case, so what's going on? And we can explore it together and see whether, because there's a huge problem right now that you probably also are all very aware of, that is, is full of fake news, is full of people just saying whatever they just heard as if it was the truth. And yeah, sometimes it has, you have to be very careful. We have to be very careful in order to prepare this webinar. I had to read a lot and then I had to filter a lot uh, because there is a lot of information around that sometimes it's not very reliable. So it happens to all of us, including people that are very knowledgeable. So if you at some point saw that, I don't know, something you shared, then you realize that it was not true. You can always just say, you know what, this thing I shared, it was not true be humble and do it it's better to do it than than to just pretend that you didn't share it um because like that you also help yourself educate other people uh, now you know and the next time somebody says yeah because bacteria no not bacteria virus so it's small things but um it happened to me i have well this sister that i mentioned a lot um she once yes. asked me she once asked me uh why is it that bacteria like coronavirus no 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 okay let's start over bacteria virus um it is it is very common and we don't have to know everything i know all this because i studied for 10 years but it is perfectly okay not to know it and just ask and read and yeah send That's, more uh... send me emails if you want <laughs> thank you that's just a perfect example that we can apply in so many areas of our lives uh, and uh, i see uh, diana which is a mentor from our uh, first tech challenge team here in bucharest uh, you are muted maybe you want to ask a, a question or give a now just uh, just i wish to thanks eugenia and to you gabby also uh, I'm glad to have the opportunity to participate in such interesting presentation, in fact, topical. And uh, it's more, uh, I'm more glad that uh, being in the process of uh, elaborating my dissertation thesis on COVID-19 uh, uh, in this day for my uh, master. Wow. Uh, yes, uh, I, I developed some um, epidemiological uh, algorithm, CIS, suspect uh, infect infection and suspect again is very very interesting uh, eugenia presentations and i'm glad gabby you organize this webinar thank you so much yes. <laughs> thank you and if you if you need at some point any help with a with a the thesis thank you so let much me send me an so email much. i just put my email in the chat i can proofread something or well my Romanian is maybe not ideal, but uh, yeah. In fact, mm -hmm. I I developed some uh, database of Europe from nice. COVID nineteen, but I have something from France also. <laughs> nice. 
That's very good. Thank you. Thank you. Great. That's very interesting to hear. Great connection. It's opportunity for our students to, to learn something like this, <laughs> something different uh, than they are usually with robotics or uh, <laughs> mathematics, physics. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Well, my, my sister herself, she actually attended the first webinar that I did on coronavirus, uh, well, on viruses. And, uh, and she was so proud. She wanted me to, to just give it again to, to some other students and other because she was like, I learned a lot. Now I know what a virus is. <laughs> so it's really, it's also really nice to also have the opportunity basically of turning this situation that we are all in into an opportunity to learn more things to, because this is not only useful for COVID-19. This is useful for whenever you encounter someone that has any type of viral disease or yourself, you know well how to react. Like one of the biggest things you were saying, you know, the virus and the bacteria. Um, one of the biggest mistakes that people tend to do is when there is a viral disease, they want to give antibiotics. And antibiotics work for bacteria, but not for viruses. So it's in thinking that a virus and a bacteria are the same, a lot of people tend to confuse also how you can treat them. So it's small things, but small things that, you know, they can help a lot of people if you just tell them, hey, no, the virus, you cannot really treat it like this. Um, or knowing why a disease has certain symptoms and not another is also something that uh, is good to, good to know, like that the virus cannot infect every single tissue, it infects only some. So there are small concepts that are very, very common, um, but I think are very useful. So I'm happy you liked it. Absolutely. So if there are no more other questions or ideas, uh, I would like to thank you, Eugenia, very, thank you much. very much. It's been interesting. So we'll surely make